All right, Jordan Reed, draft analyst for ESPN, coming off of a star turn on the three days of coverage on ESPN's Family of Networks. What's going on, man? I'm good, man. Things have calmed down for me just a little bit. So going knee deep into the 2025 class before I recharge the battery in June. They have not. They have not slowed down for you, bro. You you like two <laughs> days after the draft, you dropped a 2025 mock draft. Yeah, I mean, you have to watch those guys early on just because you're playing catch up if you don't. So. So um, I love it. That's what we're going to go through here today. You can never start too early because I also think there's there's so many things you can learn from it. Like I was going through here and I'm saying, okay, Penn State's got two first round projected first round picks going into this year on defense. Like we should know that going into Big Ten season. I think some of these and you do so much more nuanced work than I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of these these rankings a year out a lot of times from less established services it's just recruiting rankings two years later. And that is the most frustrating thing to me because I, you will look in, I know the ACC as well as anybody uh, is, is more than I know any other conference, which is a grim thing to say. I'm an SEC expert, uh, ACC expert, excuse me. Um, that's it's, I don't recommend being an ACC expert by the way. Um, <laughs> but, but you see these guys and it's like, okay, well, this guy was a, you know, the, the fourth ranked player in the class of, of 20, whatever now, 2023. And now we're just assuming because of the height, weight, speed, he's going to go ninth overall in the draft. And he hasn't done anything in some cases. He hasn't stepped out in the field, you know, Oh, he, he might portal all that stuff. Or if he did portal, the team wouldn't be upset. I think we've gotten, I think the ground has shifted beneath everybody's feet in the draft so much because of the portal, because I don't think anybody kind of realizes, um, and we can get into this, uh, the depth that teams have, um, how many quote unquote uh, stud recruits, blue chip recruits are actively being uh, recruited over in the portal um, or, or what, I mean, this is a long version of saying like, it's harder than ever, I think, Jordan, to figure out a year out who's going to pop because of the portal because of the way recruiting kind of works now because of the the age of the prospects which is getting older and older um have you noticed much of a difference in the last two or three cycles yeah for sure and this will be one of the few classes um that didn't have to really experience covid um in college oh god no more 27 year olds (laughs) yeah so what you're noticing is that we're gonna have a lot of 20 and 21 year olds in this draft class, which is great for us NFL evaluators, just because you're dealing with a lot of times in previous classes with 25 or even 24 year old type of prospects. We had an older class last year. So this is the first year where we didn't have that a class that had to go through the whole COVID ordeal. So that was a pleasant uh, thing in this draft class, but also it feels like every player, especially in the first round that they transferred from somewhere, yep. Uh, So that's something that we definitely have to get used to. And if you remember, like I would say four or five years ago, when we're talking about evaluating guys for the NFL, if they transfer two or three, even four times, it really was a Mm -hmm. knock against them. You have to figure out like, why, why was this guy leaving? But now it's really become the norm with a lot of these prospects. Mm -hmm. You're expecting them to transfer um, two or even three times. Yeah, I mean, it used to it used to be a big thing. Well, why do they transfer? Figure out why they transferred. You look at somebody like Caleb Downs, who goes from Alabama to Ohio State. No questions. We know exactly why he transferred. Coaching change. Plus, I'm sure there was some NIL involved. Uh, obviously, at a premium position as a defensive back, you're going to have competition for that. Like, I, I, there are literally no questions. You went to go better yourself. There's going to be better scheme fits. All of that stuff. So, I, I agree that the sort of the COVID seniors working their way out of the sport. God bless them. I'm glad they got a college experience, but we didn't need that. Although Miami, I think, has a ninth year guy. Literally, Miami, one of Miami's like third string blocking tight ends, uh, Cam McCormick, was one spot. I'm not making this up. Was one spot in his recruiting rankings in the state of Oregon ahead of Justin Herbert. Oh wow! Justin Herbert's I mean, in the middle of his second contract. <laughs> and I mean, at least he's getting this college paid for. Not only undergrad, master's degree. I mean, he better have. A Probably lot a of law degrees. degrees. Law degree paid he off. He better have too. a lot of degrees to show for that. He's like Buster Bluth, Ben. You cannot be in school that long. Um, as, as they said, I think it was a Tommy boy. Yeah, lots of lots of people stay in, in school for six years. They're called doctors. Um, all right, let's uh, let's get to it. I, I want to start here. You have Carson Beck, number one, and you projected. We don't know what the first overall pick is going to be. You say that in the piece because you put the Panthers there. Uh, 
I would hope that the Panthers maybe win a couple games, but I even still, even if there's room for improvement, they might be picking first overall. Um, I think a lot of teams that end up getting the first overall pick tend to tend to do it on accident. Don't they're not actively tanking. I think the Panthers are somewhere in the middle. Um, let's start here. So Carson Beck, if Carson Beck came out this year, Jordan, he goes where? I, I think he probably would go somewhere in the top 50, honestly. And he actually contemplated coming out this year. Yeah, and- yeah I remember. So for ESPN Plus, I do our quarterback hot board every year. And before he went back to school, he actually was my fourth guy ahead of J.J. McCarthy. So that just goes to show you that he definitely was in the mix to be one of those top 50 guys. But once again, like some of the other guys that we saw in this draft class, he was only a one-year starter. So that was the big worry with Beck. And I'm happy that he did go back just because I think he's definitely going to help himself this year, but he was one player that definitely was in the mix to probably be a top 50 pick. If I had to guess, he probably goes early second round. I think he probably would have went somewhere in that mix just because the sample size was so small with him, but he has a lot of the traits that you love to see in the position. Now he didn't play well in a lot of big games that they had last year. I didn't think he played well in the sec title game against Alabama. I thought he struggled in some spots, but he's going to get another opportunity to answer that this year. Um, now being with a tougher schedule, he's going to play some more higher end opponents. And then also he's going to get a chance to show that what he showed during his first year wasn't a fluke at all. So in a down quarterback class right now, quote unquote, mm-hmm. down under uh, undergrad class, uh, excuse me, down quarterback class. Overall, things could change quickly, especially if he does play well. And then every year there's always that guy that comes out of nowhere, like we saw with Jaden Daniels last year. That I was going to get into that, but I want to stay on Beck here for a second. Is there something scouts want to see other than big, better big game performance? There's something where they say he's got to get better at blank. Just consistency with his accuracy. And he showed in spots that he can be a big time player in some games. Like I thought he was great in the Kentucky game. Um, he was really good in the Florida game. There's plenty of others that he was good in, but just the consistency with his ball placement and then showing Um, that he can be he can get himself out of trouble a little bit better I don't think he's a high-end athlete but just showing that his mobility can be better um, in spots as far as when plays do break down um, showing that he has the mobility to get himself out of some bad situations so just being a better athlete overall picking and choosing when he does take off and run and getting those small gains as opposed to taking some bad sacks in some circumstances and then also just having better ball placement in spots any inkling lean on so i I, this was a three quarterback draft i felt and i think jj mccarthy rose because the vikings needed a quarterback frankly how deep right now does this go as far as quarterbacks a two quarterback draft three quarterback draft and how deep will it go i want to get into some of the names here as well and like how like is it going to be a quarterback quarterback rich draft by by this time next year it's kind of tbd honestly i don't want to swing either way just because if beck shador sanders and quinn ewers play bad then now we're talking about 2022 territory with Kenny yep. Pickett and Malik Willis and Desmond Ritter and that type of class. Christ but Almighty. if Beck plays well, Shador comes out and he answers the questions that are out there about him. And then Quinn Ewers shows more consistency over the long haul of the season. Now we have, I wouldn't say a strong quarterback class, but I think it would be a promising one. And then like we talked about, there's always a guy that comes out of nowhere as well. I think there might be multiple. I want to get in a second, but let's do this. Quarterback needy teams next year. I just want to run through them, okay? Perhaps the Jets, just because when you have an aging quarterback, you just never know. So perhaps the Jets. I think the, in, in that division, I think the Bills, Dolphins, Patriots, obviously set. Uh, I mean, I'm putting the Browns on an island of their own. They're frankly quarterback needy right now, but there's extenuating circumstances to prevent them from being quarterback needy. And as much as they gave the most guaranteed money or the biggest guaranteed all guaranteed deal in history to a quarterback who is currently bad. Um, Steelers could be in that mix. If the Russell Wilson thing doesn't work, although that might not be their MO. They're spending a lot of resources there. Uh, I think the Jaguars are set. Colts are set. Titans, I think could be really interesting. We'll see. I think the Brian Callahan is going to maximize Will Levis and they're going to kind of know going forward. Obviously, the Raiders, you have the Raiders. I believe you, believe you have the Raiders taking Shadur Sanders, right? I do. Yes. Explain that fit and why Shadur Sanders would be that good. So when I think of Shador, um, we know that he loves the spotlight. Like that's something that he loves. He has to be in a big city. We've seen what Coach Prime has already said. 
They're not going to play anywhere cold, which is going to be <laughs> a really interesting thing to see unfold. But I just think of Vegas. They want to welcome a big personality like Shador. I think Antonio Pierce would be a coach that would be fine with welcoming everything that comes with Shador. And then also they have the personnel to welcome a quarterback right now. They just took mm-hmm. Brock Bowers. They have Devontae Adams, who is on the back end of his career. Jacoby Myers, who I think is an underrated player. He just took Michael Mayer in the second round as well a year ago. So they have some promising personnel to drop a quarterback in right now. And just from an off-the-field standpoint, I think it would be a really good fit for Shador as well. They also have the quarterback depth chart to welcome another quarterback in. Yeah. When you were saying they have the personnel to accommodate another quarterback, I was like, yeah, their quarterback room. That's that's the personnel that they have to accommodate that. Uh, quickly in the NFC, Giants, I think, probably a no-brainer. For the love of God, I hope Dallas is not in the market for a quarterback next year, but I just don't trust them. I just <laughs> don't trust them to calmly you. and coolly get that deal done. Also, I think that a lot of people are going to – be blown away when they see what Dak Prescott can command in the open market. Yeah. It's also a stimulus check to our industry to have Dak Prescott going into free agency year. I'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Detroit, they're going to extend golf. Uh, everybody else in the, in the NFC North is settled. NFC South. I think Baker's probably the answer. The saints, depending on what they want to do with Derek Carr's salary, they're kind of always an option. Hey, the Falcons, you never know. You never right. know in the never Falcons, know. but let's, let's assume, <laughs> let's assume. I, can I throw this out there real quick? How good does Bryce Young have to be this year for the Panthers next year? Not to say, not not I'm not saying first round, but I I don't and I'm not even saying draft quarterback. But doesn't Bryce Young have to clear a bar for them this time next year to not at least bring in some competition or bring in a veteran who could be there in case Bryce Young just doesn't make it? Yeah, I mean I think it'll be fine. Now he has to play better than what he did a year ago. And I think he will just because the offensive line I think will so be too. better with the free agents that they brought in. And then the receivers, I think they've done a decent job for the most part, bringing in some more targets for Bryce Young. So I expect him to play better. Now I would say um, it would be different if the head coach and the GM or excuse me, the GM wasn't there when they picked him. Right. But with Dan Morgan being there when they made the selection mm-hmm. of Bryce, I think the leash is going to be a little bit longer just because he was a part of the process and the regime um, that did select him number one overall. But if they bought in an exterior candidate that wasn't a part of selecting Bryce, now I think things would have been more on the path that you're leaning towards as far as them possibly bringing in a proven veteran or even taking somebody in the draft next year. So I think they'll give him a pretty long leash just because Dan Morgan was a part of the process that made him the number one pick. I agree. I, I, I don't, I just think there has to be a, but if he's a complete, if he's a absolute like historic Zach Wilson style disaster, yeah, you start looking at other options. If he shows some improvement, I think you understand the circumstances around it and, and you go from there. So I'm not, this is not me sounding the alarm. It's just saying it's only human nature that there would be some baseline um nfc west very quickly obviously niners are spoken for seahawks i think are probably spoken for cardinals they seem to like kyler there the only one i would watch there is just matthew stafford's health um just just make sure this is a guy who's taken a lot of hits just make sure he still is able to play wants to play all that stuff but i i I don't i don't see any cause for concern there so those are the teams um i'm not putting the rams in that bucket um all right so more interesting question is who is this year's Jaden Daniels or Bo Nix is, is another example. Bo Nix at least showed more the year before, but from a college standpoint, he, like there was a reason he got the NIL money to come back. Like he was a very, very, very good college quarterback two years ago. He had one of the best sort of ascents year over year that we've seen in college football. Uh, so he's a little bit different, but there's some interesting names, especially in the portal. And that's the reason I think that when I look at the portal and I see, you know, I'm not going to count Caleb Williams as one of this basically half the quarterbacks in the first round in, in the first round um, were portal quarterbacks. Caleb Williams, I'm not going to put in there because he would have been a first round pick anywhere, but Jaden Daniels would not have been a first over first round pick without, w- w- without the portal. Bo Nix would not have been a first round pick without the portal. Michael Penix would not have been a first round pick without the portal. So we're going to see guys. And I'm looking at the top quarterback transfers here. Uh, Quinn Ewers already transferred. I'm not counting. Quinn Ewers is almost like a Caleb Williams. I think the, mm-hmm. the transfer was incidental. Like he just wasn't going to, he wasn't playing at Ohio state. Didn't want to do it. That, that wasn't a, he needed to go somewhere for the scheme thing. Even though I think Sark is a really good offensive coach. I think 
Will Howard at Ohio State, a little bit different guy. That's maybe more of the speed. Um, I don't think DJU at Florida State is going to be much, but it's still interesting to point out he's transferred twice. Maybe Norvell shows something uh, in that system that, that we haven't seen before. Cam Ward going from Washington State, uh, transferred twice, going from Washington State to, to, to Miami. He's going to have weapons. He's going to have really good offensive line. Um, Dylan Gabriel, I don't, I don't even know how you view that, but he's going to put up a bunch of numbers. Um, and then Jalen Milrow, not a transfer. Carson Beck, not a transfer. Um, so what, and these are, I'm just going to the Heisman odds here. Is there a guy that jumps out to you and say, man, I, I love that situation. I'm monitoring it for a guy who might get into the first round. So it's actually one that you didn't even mention. And it's Riley. Oh, Leonard. baby. It's Riley. Oh Leonard yeah. I Dame. love Riley Leonard. Yeah. All right. You have the floor. You have the floor. I'm Riley. So Leonard. it's really interesting just because I tracked Riley really closely at Duke last year. And I was at the Clemson game of where he was efficient as far as his passing. And I know the stats weren't great, but from a running standpoint, he's a underrated uh, mobile guy. Mm -hmm. He was a basketball player, big time basketball player in Alabama, had a bunch of um, FCS and FBS offers coming out. So the mobility and athleticism is very evident. But Duke, outside of Graham Barton, they just didn't have the offensive line to hold up against some of those really talented off or defensive fronts. So what you notice is that everything that Duke ran was quick game. It was quick game. It was screens. It was getting the ball out as quickly as possible. So he was in no man's land a ton in that offense, but he was really efficient uh, sometimes when they did let him throw the ball down the field, but it just wasn't a huge part of their offense. And if you remember, Duke got off to a great start last year before he got the ankle injury. I believe it was the Notre Dame game. And mm -hmm. you remember him and Sam Hartman connected on the sideline yep, after the yep, game. Yep. And that's where everybody started reading the tea leaves of, hey, he possibly could go to Notre Dame next we year. We thought but, Sam Hartman was being a great guy, but he was just yeah. tampering. <laughs> that's all. That the early joke, recruiting the pitch. That's all Not it a was. Joke. Not a joke. But what makes this thing really interesting, Kevin, is that the OC, Mike Dembrock, that was at LSU last year, is mm -hmm. now at Notre Dame. So he's going to be in the offense that Jaden Daniels was in over the past two seasons during his time at LSU. So those question marks that we had about him possibly throwing the ball down the field, now we're going to be able to see him open it up a little bit more. And LSU, uh, we saw what Jaden Daniels and how he was able to expedite his development and it was all she wrote after that he ended up being a number two overall pick to Washington. So now with Riley Leonard, if he's able to stay healthy, I think he's a really underrated player that could shoot up draft boards as long as he does stay healthy. Why should you bet with Caesar Sportsbook? Two words, Caesar's rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. Hey, I, I, because I'm a bad host, I have a follow-up question on Shadur Sanders, um, going back to, to five questions ago. But again, I'm a terrible host, so I'm exempted <laughs> from, uh, from the normal rules of hosting. Is there a comp for him? Because I just watch him. Um, he got sacked a lot more than he did last uh, two years ago at Jackson State. That's just going to happen because of, first of all, power five front sevens and also – the fact that the transfer portal doesn't have any good offensive linemen ever. Uh, defensive backs and and uh, and offensive linemen, you're always going to struggle in the portal. That's going to be the one weakness of the Deion Sanders experiment for for a long time. Um, having said that, is there a comp for you where you say, when I see Shadow Sanders, I see this guy? Yeah, so last summer um, when I was studying all these guys, putting together the QB hot board, I like to write down comps after I watch about four or five games of a guy, just for whatever reason, they just come naturally to me. And one – that I thought was perfect for him was Geno Smith. I think he reminds yeah. me so much of Geno. And if you remember when Geno was coming out of West Virginia, a lot of people thought he was going to be a very high first round pick. He started off his final year. I believe it was like 24 touchdowns, no interceptions. He was the front runner for the Heisman. There were so many things um, that he was operating well. But what I think they have so similar is that the calmness under pressure, the natural throwers of the ball, but their A-plus trait is they're deadly accurate. And that's something that is consistent with Shador. Whenever he is protected, he is so accurate. And I come back to that Colorado State game of where all of us East Coasters were up until 2 or 3 in the morning watching mm -hmm. that game. But not only was the poise under pressure so good, but just how well he maneuvers inside of the pocket. And even though he's not an overly great athlete, the thing that is always consistent in his game is just the ball placement. And that's something that's going to have to carry over to the NFL. And I think it will. And like Gino, he's not an overly great athlete, but the accuracy is really good. 
and then just how natural of a thrower each one is. I think they have a lot of similar parallels, and they're the exact same size as well, both about 6'2", uh, 215 to 220 pounds. Interesting. Uh, all right, so looking at your 2025 mock draft, I couldn't help but notice there are defenders there, which we did not see in the top <laughs> half of the draft. Uh, James Pierce is someone who I think you had him in the top five, but he's someone who's been mocked at number one in some drafts. I, 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 I sort of am on your side as far as like a quarterback will probably go number one for the rest of time. That's just kind of how things work. Unless it's a Kenny Pickett style, you're, you're just going to have a quarterback because the coaches get involved, the owners get involved, and all of a sudden a quarterback goes number one overall if he's even – if a quarterback has a first-round grade and he's available, he will probably go in the top five for the rest of time. Like that, that's just sort of how I, I view that. But – um, obviously James Pierce gets mocked first overall in some of these places. You have Williams from Georgia, I think going second overall, is this the pendulum swinging back to defense or was what we saw a symptom of just how teams view modern offense and that the, the wide receivers and the skill guys and the quarterbacks will just rise up the board over the next 12 months. I think it was just a circumstance with that draft class, honestly, and how we didn't have a Aiden Hutchinson, Derek Stingley, Sauce yeah. Gardner type of defensive prospect. Now, I never would have guessed in a million years that we didn't get the first one to come off of the board until the 15th overall pick. But realistically, I thought the first one could come off at eight with the Falcons or nine to the Bears just because they both needed pass rushers. But with this class, I mean, I think I had 19 defensive prospects in the first round, which is a mm. very high number. 12 of those were defensive linemen. So the way that we talked about this past season, or this past year's offensive tackle class, is going to be the same way that we talk about this upcoming defensive line class is is absolutely loaded. And I'm excited to see how it does end up unfolding just because like quarterback, there's always another one that comes out of nowhere. Just speaking of defensive linemen mm -hmm. that just has an astronomically really good year. So this pass rushing class is really good, but also we're going to have that a high end defensive type of prospect, not only in the top five, but throughout the first round. Can you take me through the top tier of pass rushers that are going to be available for a team? Because everybody needs cornerbacks and pass rushers over and over and over again. Every, so every fan listening is saying, oh, we could use a pass rusher. Take me through the top tier of those guys and how many have the chance to be the first pass rusher off the board uh, looking at it 12 months out. So there's really three guys I think could be the first ones off of the board. And I'll start with the first one who you're going to see mocked as the number one overall pick is James mm -hmm. Pierce Jr., out of Tennessee. He reminds me a lot of Josh Allen when he was coming out of Kentucky. Very similar size, really explosive, has fantastic bend. He can drop in coverage. And then he already has a full arsenal of pass rush moves. I mean, there isn't anything that he doesn't already have already in his skill set. It's just a matter of him repeating his success from a season ago. And I mean, he was absolutely terrific last year, but his combination of bend, explosiveness, first step quickness. There's not going to be anybody in the country that consistently can block them. And I mean, you can go watch them against JC Latham in the Alabama game last year. Mm -hmm. JC really struggled with him, whether it was running down the middle of his body, uh, running the arc uh, around his outside shoulder, he gave him fits. And I think that's something that he's going to continue to do uh, throughout his final year at Tennessee. The second one would be Michael Williams out of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Now he's much more of a projection and I just look at his size, Kevin. He's 6'5", 265 pounds. He's still only 19 years old. And he also is another one that is just an outstanding run defender. But he's really raw as a pass rusher. But he reminds me he's really a copy-paste of Trayvon Walker as a prospect. Ooh. Literally. Same school, same size. I was literally going to bring that up when you're, talking about, when you're talking about projects, projects and athleticism. And we know, if, you don't, if you're not a big college football fan, Kirby – only draft special body types and special athletes. Literally. Yeah. Like that is, he has baseline stat. And there's a very funny story that was told in a broadcast a couple of years ago. Will Anderson grew up in Georgia. Kirby looked at him and said, I, I just don't see the body type. And they passed on him. They're, they are not messing around with their standards. And so someone like that, you you know what the body type and the, the athleticism is going to be. And then the projection is from there. And if you remember, the big question about Trayvon coming out was, with things ever going to click for him as a pass rusher. Yep. And that's going to be the big question about Michael. But I just look at the size. I look at the age. And even though he's only had four and a half sacks over the past two seasons, nine total, he's had four and a half his freshman and sophomore year. He's going to be playing outside linebacker this year. So he's going to be standing up. He's going to be rushing the passer much more. They primarily played him 
at defensive tackle for the most part. So he's going to be transitioning outside. And his athletic profile is going to be outstanding. He's one of those guys that's going to be a freaky tester. And then you combine the size, the speed, the athleticism in with all of that stuff, he's going to shoot up boards. And a lot of mock drafts, he's probably going to be, you know, in the 10 to 20 range. But once you see the size, you see the athleticism, things eventually are going to click for him. But coaches love the baseline traits that he already has. So once coaches get involved with the scouting process, he's going to fly up boards like what we saw with Trayvon Walker. And then the last one is Abdul Carter out of Penn State. Yep. And Penn State. if you watch Penn State last year, he primarily played middle linebacker. But And I thought he was fine there, but they need some pass rushers off of the edge. So with Penn State, they said, hey, let's put one of our best athletes off of the edge. And I think he's going to shine there. So he's very similar to Micah Parsons. And it's not just the number and the size, but – with Micah, he primarily played linebacker, but a lot of people said, no, you should play him at defensive end. They didn't do that. So they said, hey, let's not make this mistake again, and let's go ahead and put this guy with freaky athleticism that looks very similar to Micah. Let's go ahead and rush him off of the edge and see what happens. So that's what's going to happen with Abdul Carter this year. Hey, I'm going to ask about Williams. Any so, so sometimes it's just bad luck, but and you heard this at the beginning. I, I don't know if anybody's old enough for this. I certainly am. When, I don't know, 2013, 2012, there was a lot of talk that a lot of the Alabama guys just didn't hit in the way people thought they would. And there was talk about maybe they practice too hard, they're too injury prone, they play through injuries. That was always, some of the players even said, you know, that playing in Alabama was hard on your body. Maybe there's more wear and tear when you get there. This was all like, this has all been in the rearview mirror because, because Saban put some, some gold jackets in a bunch of his, his products in the ensuing decade, as we know. Um, but is there any explanation for you yet? Why a lot of the unbelievable athletes who've come out of Georgia, who've been first round picks when, and I, I, I'm all for it because I just think that you draft special athletes to figure the rest out later. There hasn't been that absolute superstar out of Georgia. Any reason for that? Or is it just kind of bad luck? Like what we saw with Saban, what, 15 years ago? I think it's a case by case basis, honestly, depending on the player. And I remember that um, I was a young scout then of where there was a lot of questions about, is there more juice left to squeeze out of those guys? Just because Saban and Kirby, they get so much out of those guys, how much potential is left in them. But I would argue Jalen Carter was one of the best defensive yeah. rookies in the league last year. So that's why I say it's really a case by case basis. And I don't think it's a situation of where it's just a circumstance of where a lot of those guys are burnt out or anything like that. I just think it's a case by case basis with each prospect. I, that, that's totally fair. Um, we know Georgia is going to be good. They're always good. They're going to be good forever until like Kirby Woods got a $130 million extension bargain. Yeah. Not too Bargain. bad. <laughs> Not too bad. Good work if you can get it. Um, but is there a team, maybe Penn State is the answer here, is there a team where you start to look at their too deep and you start to see the NFL prospects and you start to see the vision and you say, man, as a program, we should be talking a lot more about this team? Uh, I mean, outside of the obvious ones, there isn't sure. one that's like just jumped off the screen at me. I think your teams are going to be the teams this year. Texas is going to be really good. They got a lot of yep. guys out of the portal, and their two deep is really good. The quarterback situation is going to be something that's really interesting. That's going to make a lot of headlines every yep. single week. Um, Alabama, I think they got a chance to be really good. It's going to be really interesting to see how the identity of their team really shifts this year, especially with the offense being a little bit more wide open and not a lot of heavy personnel like we've seen in previous seasons. Um, from some of their offensive coordinators. Um, I mean, Ohio State is absolutely loaded with their entire yeah, defense uh, pretty much coming back. I think they're going to be a contender. Unbelievable. So, if you I mean, are an NFL scout, what is it, October 12th? Get to Ohio State, Oregon. That's my only piece of yeah. advice if you're an NFL scout. That's that's going to determine a lot. Um, that's To me, that's the game of the college football season um, yeah. because I just think that both of those teams – I don't see many losses now that Harbaugh is gone. I just don't see many losses outside of those that game. But also with the 12 team playoff, they'll probably play again in the semifinal. So too bad they ruined college football, Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Regular we were season needs to be something. Rematches. We're I'm going to tell, tell my grandkids year. about the time that, that <laughs> you know 10 years ago when one loss used to be devastating. Now it's like, oh man, that's really going to hurt our seating three months from now. I hate it. Um, any other big picture draft thoughts that stood out to you when doing this mock, Jordan? That I didn't bring up. 
Um, not really. I think the quarterbacks are going to be something that's really interesting just because last year we knew coming into the year, Drake May, Caleb Williams was going to be like the battle that everybody watched throughout the year. So really, which quarterback catapults themselves to be that certified QB1 or QB2? How really does the order really shake itself out? Um, running back will be really interesting this year just because we have yeah. an absolutely loaded running back class upcoming. Yeah. Um, you know, Quishot Jenkins and Travion Henderson, who are at Ohio State, that's going to be a really interesting ordeal to see how that does end up shaking out. They're going to be two guys that have a chance to be drafted within the first two rounds. Um, so running back is something. Edge rusher we talked about, defensive line. The cornerback class is really interesting. And then Travis Hunter, I think that'll be something that's interesting mm-hmm. to track, whether he's a wide receiver or a corner. Do teams like him at both as well? Where do you lean? On I like him better as a corner, honestly. I think he's really, really gifted as a corner. Um, but I'm not going to complain if he does want to be a wide receiver. I think he's a playmaker. Either way, I think he's going to be a good pro either way, too. This might be the old man in me, but if you can play corner, play corner. Like, if I'm a coach, I need corners. I can I can create receivers anywhere. Quarterbacks can create receivers. Scheme can create receivers. You cannot create cornerbacks. If you have special athleticism at cornerback, that's that, I want you on defense. Go practice in the DB's room. Jordan Reed, ESPN draft analyst, one of our favorite guests. Thank you so much for coming on this football, buddy. Thank you as always, Kevin. It's always a pleasure.